I've been carrying around this huge bag full of bitterness, full of hatred, full of anger for years. All I was thinking about is revenge. I was thinking about what you have done to me, I can do to you. The hurt's too deep, the scars are too deep. No, I'm not going to forgive because I'm not going to let these people off the hook. If you continue to hold on to a problem, or issue, anger, whatever it is, sooner or later you become that problem. We just thank you, Lord, for what's going to take place today at Stillwater Prison. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 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 Now really act like you like each other. It's going to be hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be hard, John. Beautiful. Here we go. Nice pictures. Especially of the woman that's in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> I can't argue with that. My son, Lorraine, was at an after-hour party, and there was a verbal confrontation. There was gunshots, and Lorraine was laying on the floor, and a young man was standing over Lorraine and pointing the gun at his head. And uh, he yelled, don't do it, and the trigger was pulled. I worked downtown at the phone company. My phone rang, and the phone must have went one way, and my body must have went another because when I came to myself, my supervisor was holding me. The next thing I recall is I'm at my sister's walking to her door and she's standing there waiting for me. And she says, Mary, the detectives are here. They stayed with me until the more called and identified the body that they had of being my only child. I got a call from the detectives, and he was telling me that they had picked up the young man that murdered my son, the boy that had murdered him, and that he was 16 years old. Someone gave me up, told them where I was, where I would be at, and that's how I was apprehended a couple days later. I started going to the different hearings. I hated this boy, and my justice was that he would be up for first degree murder, and that he would get life in prison, that he was an animal, and he deserved to be caged for the rest of his life. The judge didn't want to give a boy life in prison. And the judge pronounced a 25 and a half year sentence. I wanted life. I felt he deserved life. And he did not deserve to be out here walking around. this weekend, I thought it was time to call my family together and start sharing stuff. My son is coming with his partner. I want my children to share the connection with the land. 
It may not be deep to start off with, but more importantly, I feel at peace with it. Hi, Good to see you. Hi, Will. All right, go, come on. So, how was the ride across the channel, all right? Yeah, it was very rough. Was it, was it really? Oh, yeah, I suppose it would be. Down that Dutch. Oh, okay. One of the hardest things I've had to do as a mum is to tell my children of my history um, without judgment and without bias. I was 18 months when me and my brothers and sisters were all removed from our family. We were separated out to different foster homes, children's homes, and so on. They just came in and mum had no power, just grabbed us and threw us in the car and off we went. And imagine a mother watching her children go off in a car. I was placed with several foster homes and ended up in one foster home and there I remained for the next 13 years. I had no contact with my mum or dad, I didn't know their names. I was not told anything calling the parents auntie and uncle. I knew that they weren't my parents, but I didn't know where mine were. And when asked, it was like, well, you know, they weren't any good for you, so you've been placed with us. Growing up in this foster home was not a good experience. It was uh, very abusive. I mean, I lost my innocence at the age of five from my foster father. That was sexual abuse on a daily basis. Then my brothers, my foster brothers, um, actually were at it too. The authorities, I'm sure, in reading through my file, there was a su suggestion of interfamily relations. They knew. See, so and no protection. So there was the beatings and the sexual abuse and, and the emotional abuse too, you know, about my family, like, we know who your family is, but we're not going to tell you. I mean, head games like that. And that happened till the age of 15, so good 10 years. Hell of a lot to forgive. I am Ki Long Ng. I was born in Battambang, Cambodia. I am now living in Portland, Oregon. This trip is special because I have my family with me. We are going to Battambang, my hometown place where I was born and place where I grew up and place where I worked during the Khmer Rouge as a slave. My father's name is Ki Lin and we named my son after my father. That's Ki Lin over there. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. This is where my house used to be before the Khmer Rouge and after the Khmer Rouge, it was all demolished. It was in the middle of the Cambodian New Year. That was April 17, 1975, when the Khmer Rouge marched into my city of Battambang. They loaded a whole bunch of people on buses and took them out, out of town and executed them. The Khmer Rouge actually shut down the banks, shut down the electricity, shut down technology. When all that happened, I was your age. Really? Yeah. Just a few months or maybe a year older, but I was pretty much your age. 
we all were separated by age and gender. And I was forced to work 13 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The only thing that I was afraid of is if I weren't productive, they would kill me, they would torture me. The Khmer Rouge killed two million Cambodians, including starving my parents and killing 50 of my relatives. I miss my parents, miss my family. I, I often lie down and stay awake at night thinking maybe something good would happen. Something magical, then, then we can all reunite it again. When the trial was over, one day I was studying and I opened up this book and it fell on a poem that's entitled Two Mothers. And this poem was talking about two angels in heaven and they began to talk about their children. And one mother said, you know, I would have went to the cross. I would have taken my son's place if I could have. And the other mother fell on one knee and she said, oh, well you are she, the mother of Christ. And the mother of Christ lifted her up, kissed from her cheek a tear, and said, tell me of your trial so I may grieve with you. And she said, my son is Judas Iscariot. And it just ended there. And I had to read it again. And after I read it for the second time, what I heard was, I want mothers of murdered children and mothers of children that have taken life to come together and heal. And I thought, yeah, right. <laughs> Impossibility, that can't happen, and I don't want it to happen. I mean, I can't see myself trying to heal with his mother. And it had been 12 years that I'd been holding on to all of that. During those years, I was hearing, you know, pray for old Shay. Then I'd hear, pray for him like you're praying for yourself. Then I would hear, every time you hear his name, even if it was 50 times in one day, to say, I choose to forgive him. I choose to forgive him. I got a call from a public defender, and she was telling me about a mother, and her son had taken his friend's life, and she wanted to know if I would talk with her. We were able to relate to one another. We were able to feel each other's pain and we decided that we would start this Two Mothers group. But before that group started, I had to make sure that I had forgiven O'Shea. I always thought that I could be better. You know, I never believed that what I was told, that you are no good, you will amount to nothing. Uh, and maybe I was a bit rebellious, thinking, oh yeah, got news for you. I remember my foster mother saying to me, we are talking about religion, and I said, I don't believe in God. And she said, well, who do you believe in? You have to believe in something. And at the age of six, I said, myself, until I believe in When I was 15, I had enough of the abuse, and I took off and went to live on the streets for a while. I heard there were some jobs going with a bank in Hobart. So I went to a friend's place and cleaned myself up and walked in to the personnel manager and told him I wanted a job. And I got it. <laughs> and within a year, I was a bank manager. Your toast is ready. Oh, yep, toast ready. Good when I was 20, I had a very strong That's urge to yet. see my mum. And so I went to the authorities that actually removed me. They said they couldn't help me. So I thought, you can help me and you're going to, but we'll do it my way. 
I went into that building every day for a few weeks and just sat in the lobby and just waited patiently. Finally, I think that had enough. I made everybody feel so uncomfortable that finally a gentleman came out and, and um, he said, come with me. We went into a room and I saw a file on the desk with my name on it. Sometimes the water comes up in here. You see the water mark here sometimes. Wait, is this your house? My sister's. Yeah, my family home was already destroyed and demolished. Oh. I would walk in line with hundreds and thousands of people. Most of the time we were working in the water. During the dry season, you work in the sun and you sweat all day long. So the clothes is pretty much stay wet and your skin, you get rash and eczema and all kinds of stuff. It took human labor, slave labor, 13 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to do things like this. Now, among those thousands and thousands of people, I was one of them. I was a slave that built this dam. You only get two meals a day. Lunch is just a bowl of rice porridge made up of mostly water. If you pour the water out, you get about two tablespoons of solid rice. And the same amount of, of meal you get for dinner. And people die of exhaustion, die of starvation. And I was about this tall. That's so everything seems even t higher or taller. Yeah. yeah. We weren't allowed to have emotion. I wouldn't call my mother mom or my dad, dad. But instead, I would have to call them friend or comrade. My sister and I were working literally 20 feet, 30 feet from each other, but I couldn't give any signal. And I couldn't just openly smile or wave or say hi or anything like that. Walking past each other, we send a secret signal that, yeah, I acknowledge that you're here. I recognize you here, and, and that's all she, she needs to know, that I love her and she loved me, and that's it. In those days, you don't really feel, you just survive. My faith in humanity went away when I went through the Khmer Rouge, and I barely got out of the country alive. Nineteen seventy nine. Vietnam invaded Cambodia. The Vietnamese and the Khmer Rouge were fighting, and while they're fighting, they forgot about the people like me. And I got free, so I left the work camp. My sister said, I'm going to Thailand, and you're coming with me. She reached out to me for a project called Restorative Justice. And he said, absolutely not. I will not meet with her. You know, I looked at her as the part of the problem. And why do we need to talk? I wasn't in a place at that time where I was ready to accept what I had done. You know, so therefore, you his mom, you should have raised him better. This is my thinking. Then maybe we wouldn't have had to have this altercation. We waited nine months and went back again. I decided to take responsibility for my actions. Let her know what happened, why it happened, and you know, to try to help her get closure. When I didn't know what I was gonna do when I got there, I didn't know if I was gonna try and punch him out or what, I just didn't know. You know, I'm not going to visit that 16-year-old boy. He is a man now. 
So we got in, went to a huge metal detector, never been in prison before. Went to this big, huge metal door that opened and closed by itself. Yeah, that was just kind of scary. I went into it with a clear head, not knowing what to expect. Walked in, I saw her, you know, we shook hands. You know, you have that first uncomfortable moment. But after the initial greeting, it was like, OK, I can sit down and I can do this. And I told him, look, I don't know you. You don't know me. You didn't know my son. My son didn't know you. We just need to get to know one another. Our conversation just took off. It was like a genuine back and forth conversation. I, I've learned about her. She learned about what I was going through. And then she began to tell me about her son. And I noticed that we had a lot of parallels within our life. He and I had a lot in common. We both were the only child. We both felt the need to take care of our mothers. Lorraine was a smart kid. We both joined gangs. We both decided to sell drugs. You know, we both had excuses why we stayed in rather than got out. We sat there for two hours. And I told him, I said, look, today from the bottom of my heart, I want you to know that I forgive you. I don't know, you know, you can tell a moment when you need to respond or react to it. And when we were initially getting ready to leave, I was just like, you know, may I come around the table and hug you? And she said, sure. And I hugged her. And I began to fall. And he had to hold me up. And while he was lifting me up, he whispered to me. And he said, I believe you're going to be the person to help me to cry. And I said, yes, I'm going to be that person. I think maybe that is what really started to establish our bond. Everything that happened went away. And it was just us in the moment being there with each other and, you know, just interacting on a different level. And when he left the room, I bent over and I began to say I just hugged the man that murdered my son. I just hugged the man that murdered my son. And as I stood up, I tell you, from the soles of my feet, I began to feel something move in there. And it just kept moving, and it kept moving until it was moving up my body. And it just moved up and moved up, and it, then it moved out. It left. I knew that I knew that all that hatred, the anger, the animosity, the bitterness, all that junk that was inside me for that young man for 12 years, I knew that it was over that I had truly, truly forgiven him. I finally got the address of my mum. Went to her house. I knocked on her door, my hand shaking, and uh, she opened the door, and she knew it was me. I went inside, and my brothers and sisters were there. There they'd been returned back to her. My sister was telling me, she said, do you know where we're from? And I said, no, I have no idea. And so she told me. I am an Aboriginal Tasmanian. I come from the Muanina people in the southeast of Tasmania. Settlers that settled here wanted to rid the country of Aboriginal people because they were considered natives, savages. And so over the years, the child removal policy came into play and it gave governments the power to go in and remove Aboriginal children and place them on missions, foster homes, children's homes, wherever they could, just they wanted to breed out the Aboriginality in Aboriginal people. The paler you were, the more likely you were to be taken because you could fit in with and assimilate with um, the wider community much easier. And this happened all around the country and so that's when it was named the Stolen Generations. So all of a sudden, I didn't realise which world I lived in. Does this mean that I connect back with my family or, or is it too late? I had so many questions for my mum, but you know, she was quite emotional. So I thought, just slow down, Deb. You know, you can, you can ask her, we'll have opportunities later on, get to know your mum, she gets to know me. 
But uh, sadly, that wasn't to be. Because uh, within a couple of weeks, my mum passed away and I didn't get to see her again. This is a letter that my mother wrote to the Department of Welfare in her desperate attempt to get me back. Dear sir, I'm writing once again to beg you to consider letting me have my baby. Please, sir, if there is anything else I have to do to prove myself, could you tell me what it is? But, sir, the waiting is almost unbearable. And this is a letter from my father. Dear sir, I now find it appropriate to ask you to consider the return of Deborah to us completing our family. Her birthday is next month and we have planned a little party for her combining the birthday and welcome home. The welfare said, well, look, they didn't want you. When I read these, I thought, that's lies, all lies. They did, clearly. Hmm. And I know there's one incident where <clears throat> my mother went into the welfare office and got on her hands and knees. We're headed to a Stillwater Correctional Facility where I was once actually a resident. No, this would be my first time actually re-entering a prison since I got came home. So it's kind of, it's, it, I feel good about it actually because I'm going in for a different reason. I haven't recidivated. I'm actually doing something positive. All right, so I'm gonna come up here and keep it real with y'all. You know, I'm practically at home. I hate to say it, but I am. <laughs> You know what I mean? And I generally ain't no emo type dude. I don't get emotional, but this is bittersweet for me, you know, because I'm back in here, I'm seeing familiar faces, a place that I'm familiar with, and my thing right now is growth, and this is where I've grown at. So to be back in front of y'all, man, is a real good feeling, but at the same time, I have to see y'all faces still here. Got involved in a game, didn't have to. Wasn't peer pressure, it wasn't protection. I just did it. It was something that I just did to be a part of the streets, to learn the streets a little bit better, and just to continue to spiral from there. As young people, we don't know how to deal with pain. When people ridicule and you go through a certain pain, and then you try to find a way to mask that pain to get away from that pain. And you know, once you stuff a lot of things, once you hold a lot of things in, it only takes one incident to make it come out. And it comes out, it came out wrong. So all this pain is around me active, and it's just running, running around me, and it's, it, it, and it's taking me in. You know, and now I'm projecting, I'm taking my pain and I'm putting it on your face. Her son and I had a, you know, altercation. Initially it was one of those things where you feel like it's just egos, but then it went a little bit past egos. Certain comments were made that triggered something in me. You everything I don't like. You everything I don't like about me. You everything I don't like about everything I had to go through. And right now I'm finna take you out. I'm tired of dealing with the pain. I may have put a stop to it right there, but I created a bigger pain. Because now I done, take some, I done took in someone's life. When I, when, when I projected on him, I didn't see past my own thoughts, past my own anger, past my own pain to see this lady right here. I didn't see her face. I didn't see that once I commit this act, it was going past him to her. Unforgiveness is like cancer. It will eat you from the inside out. These are grown men in prison. Man after man just stood up and said, I wish I could be in your place. I wish I could talk to my victim's family to let them know how sorry I am. And from that point on, we knew that this is what we need to be doing. What you're seeing right now is a product of where I've been, where you guys are at. Pain is real. And if you want to know what you have. And pain is love. So when you see her going through the pain that she was, you see the love that she had for her son. I know that it's very hard for him, as it is for me, when we have to stand together and share this story. But we both know that this is what we are to do. Which one? That one right here. 
Sure, go for it. I don't think it's I don't think it's ready yet. It isn't. Just go pick the just go pick the biggest one. The biggest. Yeah. I escaped Cambodia. I went to the United States, learned English, graduated from Reed College, got a master's degree from Bowling Green State University, went to work for corporations. I was struggling with life. During the day, I got to keep myself busy because I have to maintain a normal life, family life. But when I'm not busy, I'd be thinking about torturing, thinking about revenge. Their father was totally opposed to their heritage, so it, it squashed them, you know, and I didn't want to force my own thing on them, so I just let time go. There's heaps of little babies. Yeah, there's, there's a so real big huntsman in there. There's a nest, watch out. There's little babies oh, everywhere. Oh no, it's a nest. No, they're not venomous. They'll run up your legs. <laughs> oh. I've seen it all before. No, well, we're wrecking their home. Well, we've already wrecked it. Did we squash it? As if the mum's going to go somewhere and all the babies are going to follow. Well, the babies don't need her. She's not milking them. Oh, Jesus. Nah, oh, look can't deal with it. That's it. Get him curling up your arm. Will it bite me? If he rears up at you, he will. What, what will happen if it bites me? Not too much. Well, can you check the part, please? Yeah. See, it's only in the last five years or something I've begun to understand, like, Aboriginal identity and all of that. Sure, I identify as Aboriginal, but I don't really I don't mean to understand what that is, I guess. It took me a good 20 years for it mm. to adjust. Mm. You know, and learn about it all and all that kind of thing and who you are. And that will happen maybe for you one day if you want it to. Mm. But if you don't, that's all right. Yeah? Yeesh. Mm -hmm. yeah. When the kids said to me, we identify, I'm thinking, wow. Um, I don't think I said anything at the time. No. No. But I thought they had made their own mind up. Okay. Oh. Tear up. Whoa. When I did connect with elders from my country, it was a lovely experience. It was like, we're going to help you restore yourself. We would light a fire and just sit and chat. They kept a very careful eye on me, you know, very careful. And gave me lots of personal instructions, you know, which I followed. So I was instructed to by a prominent elder when she said to me, you have to learn to forgive. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. But I had a problem with this because I thought you had to be religious. The family that I grew up with were a Christian church going family. Um, and so I thought, well, I'm not going to be a Christian to have to do this. And I spoke again to elders about it and they said, no, 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 no. It's about your personal spirituality. That's where forgiveness comes. And I thought, if I forgive, does that mean that it didn't happen? Does that mean that everything's all right? 
Um, but as I went into it further and more deeply um, into my spirituality, I understand now why that elder instructed me to do that. And I just want to encourage you uh, men and you young men to come on over to the booth and get some information. Uh, we need you, brothers. Do you think that you've forgiven yourself? It's something that I struggle with. I try, and at times I do say, I, I forgive myself. You know, I was 16 years old, but then there are times when I'm struggling with whatever, and it comes back to me like, man, if I wouldn't have did this, and man, I messed my life up, and it, it's hard for, for me to forgive myself then, you know, and just for taking another life. Like, who am I to take a life? Today, we pray for your spirit of love in our community. Forgiveness is a process. It took 12 years for me to get to the place that I'm at. Send down the power of nonviolence to create change. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. She's like a woman atlas on the inside. She just got the weight of the world on her shoulders and she's pressing it up and she's keeping it moving and she's lifting up everyone around her. This little light of mine, let's bring it home. I survived the Khmer Rouge, and they have the scars to show it. But the scars that people don't often see is the emotional scar, and that's a tougher one to heal. For about 20, 30 years, it was not a night that I, I went to sleep without a nightmare. Sometimes my wife would wake me up and go like, you're sweating and you're saying crazy things, you're scaring me, wake up, wake up. I keep thinking, when am I gonna get a normal life? And then at some point I started to realize that I am holding on to this memory. And people keep saying, no, oh, just forget about it. You can't just forget about it. If I did, all of these things would have happened for no reason. I do believe forgiveness is the end stage of the grieving process and the true beginning of the healing process. I think that's probably why I was able to contribute in the way that I did, because, uh, you know, having been at peace with myself now. Australians of this generation should not be required to accept guilt and blame for past actions and policies over which they had no control. More than 15,000 people crossed the Tasman Bridge to show their support for reconciliation. Since then... I ran a um, National Sorry Day event and my children would say to me, Mum, why do you do this every year? You know, it's not going to happen. And I said, well, one day justice will come. Kevin Rudd became Prime Minister. There was a few of us that were called to meet with him and discuss doing an apology. And Kevin and I actually talked about the forgiveness process because he is a man of the faith, he's a religious man. And um, he, he wanted to know how I went about it without using religion. Yeah. And I said, well, I don't know, I just did. Welcome to Parliament House in Canberra, where the Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, will shortly offer an apology to the stolen generations of Indigenous Australia. We apologise for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on these, our fellow Australians. We apologise especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families their communities and their country. As Prime Minister of Australia, I am sorry. On behalf of the Government of Australia, I am sorry. 
On behalf of the Parliament of Australia, I am sorry. And I offer you this apology without qualification. It was electrifying, it was amazing. So no longer could historians and journalists deny what happened. At last we have been acknowledged. I couldn't wait to avoid all the media and, and go into some little corridor and, and bring my kids. And uh, I said, you know what? Justice stays here. Yesterday evening, um, two mothers came together. O'Shea's mother, Carolyn, and myself, we met for the first time. Her and I haven't talked in 17 and a half years. Yesterday was such an incredible, such an incredible evening. It ended up with her and I crying and um, accepting one another. You know, and she told me that um, she would share her son with me. We will support each other, come what may. You know, the, uh, and O'Shea, this is our son. You know, and I'm, I'm very proud and, and very glad to be able to share him with her. And I'm, I'm very glad that she accepts him as her son and her spiritual son and me as her spiritual sister. Now I know that she knows that I love her son and that I wouldn't do anything to harm him or hurt him in any way. And I'm really, really grateful for that. This is a, a picture of myself holding my son's picture. And then on the other side is O'Shea. It's, it's a growing relationship, like, she's my mother now, she's my second mother. And that's not a bunch of, you know, fluff or anything, that's really a mother, to, she's really a mother to me. I treat him like my son, I talk to him like a son. This is all he does, you know. I'm trying to figure Texan. out how to get my picture. I don't know today. what's gonna happen when texting goes away. I'm nosy, he says. Trying to get what? I'm mother number two. The mother that supports you when you need it most, she still has a chance to be a mother. Maybe it's not to her own son, but we are still family now by blood. Even though it was a shedding of blood, we are still bound by blood right now. In 1999, when I came back to Cambodia, a friend of mine told me he knew where this one guy who put me through hell, who put my family through hell. And he told me for a small amount of money, he would torture this guy or kill this guy, or I could do it myself. In those days, Cambodia did not have a law established. It was, it was still in the wild, wild west, and you can still take somebody's life and get away with it. And I thought about it, and I thought about it. It wasn't that I couldn't do it, I could do it. Who am I at this very moment? Am I a killer? Am I one of them? The Khmer Rouge would have won because they have turned me into something I should not be. So it's either kill this guy or forgive. So I chose to forgive. That was the turning point where I realized who I was and where I need to go and what I have to leave behind.
Good morning. Welcome to this restorative justice talking circle. What we'll do is begin with our survivors who are with us here telling their story. And then we'll have the men here telling your story. What happened? Are you able uh, to forgive yourself? Trying to forgive myself before was a battle for me. I'm the person that was responsible for taking her son's life. And now when I look at it, I think the reason why it's so hard for us to forgive ourselves at times is because we feel like saying that I forgive myself or I forgive you is saying that there is no responsibility or accountability. And that's actually not true. Um, I'm learning now that I have taken responsibility for my action. I am holding myself accountable for it. I also have to look at the fact of I was 16 years old. So I'm 35 now. What I had to do was go back and forgive that 16 year old boy and let him go in order to embrace the man that I've become. For those who think that us forgiving ourselves would be wrong, you have to think we will cause more wrong if we don't forgive ourselves. Now I am in the process of actually saying, and this will be the first time Mary ever heard me say this, but that I do forgive myself now. I have to, I have to let go of that 16 year old boy, so. And I had that opportunity to kill that guy 20 years after I left Cambodia, and I decided to not to do that. That was my forgiveness. Yeah. <laughs> the truth is, that guy didn't even know what I did. And that's what my definition of forgiveness is. It's not about that guy. It's about me. The distinction between forgiveness and reconciliation is very simple. Reconciliation is about the forgiven acknowledge the fault they've done. And I think my calling is forgiveness, not reconciliation. I forgive because I want to free myself. I was your victim and I now refuse to be your victim anymore. My problem is, how do I move forward from here? I decided that I wanted to be productive in looking at the statistics in Aboriginal health. And I'm currently lecturing down at the University of Wollongong in postgraduate Indigenous health subjects. I've spoken internationally in India and Geneva and, and Canada about the state of Aboriginal health in Australia, much to the embarrassment of the federal government. There's not one aspect of health that is level with mainstream. It's all three times higher, four times higher, five times higher. It's not because you have too much sugar or because you have too much flour. Actually, it's the trauma from your past and your grief and loss that's impacting on your primary health, more so than any diet. My thought on reconciliation is this. There's an Aboriginal lady there with her baby. There's a non-Aboriginal lady there with her baby. And the day we have true reconciliation is that you can say to the Aboriginal mum, your baby's going to live as long as that non-Aboriginal baby. That's reconciliation. What I do with the Golden Leaf Education Foundation is build schools in the memory of the two million Cambodians that did not so survive. Right for this first initial project that we and I want to build schools in honor of my fellow survivors. When soldiers were putting the AK-47 against my head, those were kids that weren't educated. I, I do not believe that they have the critical thinking to have a second thought whether what they did was right or wrong.
I am very excited about going to Bosat to a groundbreaking ceremony. What's so special about this one is it is in the village where former Khmer Rouge family live together with survivors. So the school that we're about to build will be a gift to the children from both sides. I didn't expect to see that many children and that many villagers are coming together and, and gave us that much a reception. Very, very overwhelming. I'm on a path to forgiveness and there's nothing as profound as this, to see other people coming together. I'm just now barely started my journey, and a lot of people in Cambodia is already ahead of me. That gives me hope. I mean, if these people can do it, I can do it. A lot of Aboriginal people around the country won't forgive. They'll accept the apology, but they won't forgive. And I think that's quite sad. Forgiveness has changed my outlook on human beings and, and the strength within human beings. To actually listen to people, to understand, empathise, um, because now I'm not all clouded up with that burden. I can think clearly. Yeah, I see the world differently now. In a more compassionate sense rather than an angry one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I met Ed about nine years ago. He had lost his son. His son had been murdered. You can go over and pick up a heart, put your loved one's name on it, and just put it on the wall over there. We ended up doing some speaking together. That inspired me to start a two dads group. We as a community, we all got to pull together. We were just really good friends, you know, who spent a lot of time together. But we were, we were just friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, we just started dating. And um, I realized, yep, I had more feelings for him than I thought I did. In memory of them, we begin this great ceremony. This is the reason why we're together. Really, it's because of our sons. I think I got teary-eyed before you actually walked down the aisle, huh? I think so, too. Yeah, because I was just looking at it like, oh, wow, she's going to go get married. He's my son. There was no way I would have gotten married without him being in it. Anytime a son is walking his mom down the aisle, you know, that's what I was thinking of. Like, somebody took her away from me now a little bit. Ed's a good guy. Ed and Mary Roy. Can everyone please stand? I couldn't imagine what it would be like today if this change hasn't taken place. You probably can't change the world, but you can change some of the things in the world. And I just want to try to make a change, you know, to get rid of some of this violence. I'm still forgiving, <laughs> you know. Um, it's not something that you do one off. Well, for me, it's not, you know. It's a process. And I found that very liberating, but I also found it necessary to survive. For what I was put through, I should have been a killer. 
but instead, I just went the opposite. I defied what the killing fields was trying to do to me. That is a revenge. Maybe the revenge is not the right word. Maybe it is more like a victory on the side of humanity.